Welcome to EPG Patshala. My name is Ipshita Chanda and I teach comparative literature at the English and Foreign Languages University in Hyderabad. This module is called Otherness and Literature and it is a part of New English Literatures. In this module, we are going to look at the concept of the other from the point of view of philosophy and try to connect the philosophical positions on the other to the critic and reading of literature. Let us begin with the question, who is the other? Edmund Husserl, famous for the phenomenological approach, says that the other impacts me unlike an object or a force. That means that the other has a will and a personality and a presence of its own. The other person can be constituted cognitively on the basis of vision, that is, I see the other and I see that she is like myself but an other. So the other can be looked at as an alter ego, a person like me. This is how Husserl constitutes the other within shared social space. However, Emmanuel Levinas criticizes Husserl saying that the idea of constitution lacks the core element of intersubjective life. He sets aside the empirical prejudices about the distinctions between subjects and objects, strips away the accumulated layers of conceptualization and wishes to reveal experience as it comes to light. So the other now stands as separate from my experience, not an object of my perception. However, Martin Heidegger has already attended to the intersubjectivity of social space long before Levinas. According to Heidegger, every subject is prior to everything else a project. In every intersubjective situation, an encounter of wills is involved between myself and the other. And this encounter generates a field of existential tension. Even simple mutual perception cannot occur without that tension. So, to perceive the other is to have a perspective on her which involves an appropriation of her as an object with a particular status and role in the projects of one's will. According to Heidegger, to recognize another locus of will, the will of another person, unleashes the energies that eventually constitute the field of existential tension of all interactions. However, Levinas resists this position and he says that the onus is on the self to be hospitable to the other. The other person addresses me, calls to me. He does not even have to utter words in order for me to feel the summons implicit in his approach. The gaze of the other, says Levinas, is interrogative and imperative. Intersubjective experience, that is, the encounter with the other in the intersubjective space, which Heidegger has called an existential tension, is, according to Levinas, ethical in the simple sense that an I discovers its own particularity when it is singled out by the gaze of the other. Levinas means that I become myself when the other gazes upon me as an object. Jacques Lacan takes the psychoanalytic position and talks about the intrapsychic otherness different from the other of interpersonal theories of identity and also distinct from the philosophical problem of other minds. According to Lacan, the subject is not an object capable of being adequately named within a natural language, like objects can be. The subject will be constituted and until it is constituted, it is nothing. Lacan proposes the idea of the split subject. The subject, he says, is split into a conscious and an unconscious. 
but as the subject of language, the subject is also split into the speaking I and the spoken about I. Let us consider an example. If I say I am fat, I, the subject or self, speak about myself or my ego. Lacan distinguishes the spoken and the sp speaking. He says the ego or moi, me in French, is the subject of what is said, that is the subject of enunciation. What my enunciated subject will speak about is me or my ego. And myself, that is je, is I who speak or enunciate. This brings us to the idea of post-humanist subjectivity. The humanist subject is conceptualized as unified and constituted as a person, as we have looked at in the module on Commonwealth literature. The humanist subject, unified and constituted as a person, is often the humanized other, the marginalized person or the marginalized other. However, the post-humanist subject, that is Lacan's idea of the subject, is radically ulterior or radically anterior to the humanist subject. Let us try to understand what is meant by radical anteriority. We begin with the proposition of the master-slave dialectic which Hegel proposed in his book Phenomenology of the Spirit. There are two dimensions to this dialectic. The first is the political or the historical dimension which Hegel says is the relationship between the feudal lords and the serfs. The second is the more fundamental psychological dimension with which we are concerned. It is the abstract account of self-consciousness in relationship or in an encounter with the other. In the encounter with the other, self-consciousness sees that other as both self and not self. It identifies the other as someone like me but not me. So self-consciousness does not see the other as another essential being but sees itself in the other. Conversely, self-identity is or originates in the exclusion of everything other outside itself. And that other is thus unessential, negative, defined in terms of the self as not-self. Therefore, this definition of the other, this negative definition, focuses on just one side of the dialectic, that is, on the other as not self and thereby establishes a distinction between the self and the not self, the self and the other. Othering is a process and the other is constituted socially and psychically. Foucault and the Frankfurt School theorists Adorno and Horkheimer argue that we produce the other through our discursive co constructions. Representations of the other are made in service of geopolitical power and domination. The metaphoric, metonomic, anthropomorphic constructions of the other are manifestations of the cultural attitudes inherent to the agent of othering. That is, I construct the other through metaphors, through metonyms, and by making the other like me. European historiographies of the non-European peoples labelled as the other were written using analytical discourses like academic, commercial, geopolitical and military discourses to explain the other in the Eastern world to the self in the Western world. One example of this is Edward Said's book Orientalism, which is an analysis of this process of othering of the homogenized Orient with respect to the dominant Occidental culture of the colonizer. Therefore, we have at least three different concepts of the other that we have discussed. The first are the subjectivist and the constructivist positions, 
taken generally by feminist and post-colonial thought. Here, self-identification is done by means of distanciation from the other, as described by Hegel in his discussion of the master-slave dialectic. For example, feminist theories construct women as the other of male of the males in patriarchy or radical feminist thought constructs the male as the other of the woman in a future feminist utopia. However, Lacanian post-humanist and Heideggerian phenomenological positions do not subscribe to either the constructivist or the subjectivist positions. We will look at how these are applied to different areas of critical theory. To begin with, area studies. The idea of the other on which area studies functions inscribes itself in theories of race, class and gender. The homogenization of an area proceeds through reification of some essential characteristics to which the area is reduced. So an area like Africa, despite its diversity, may be reduced simply to race or to neocolonization or to development. So in post-colonial theories of national identities, both placed and displaced, there is a constructivist anthropologizing idea of the other. That is, an idea of an African man or an Indian man is constructed as a homogeneous idea of the other. The identity of the other is established in relation to a series of differences that have become socially recognized. These differences are assumed as essential to the being of the other. If they did not exist as differences, the identity would not exist in its distinctness and solidity. Thus, identity and otherness forces us to congeal established identities into fixed forms, thought and lived, as if their structures expressed the true order of things, as if they were not constructed by us. The maintenance of one identity involves the conversion of some differences into otherness, into evil or one of its numerous surrogates. That is, if we define the self with the good, then necessarily the other becomes the binary opposite, that is, evil. Identity, therefore, requires difference in order to be, and it converts difference into otherness in order to secure its own self-certainty. This leads to identity politics. Identity politics is a loose connect collection of political projects undertaken by representatives of a collective with a distinctively different social location. This location has been hitherto neglected, erased or suppressed, which is why the politics concentrates on bringing this location to view. Personal identity refers to one's sense of self and its persistence, underlying many of the more overtly pragmatic debates about the merits of identity politics are philosophical questions about the nature of subjectivity and the self to which we will turn. The essentialist claims of identity politics urges a mobilization around a single axis and puts pressure on participants to identify that axis as their defining feature. In fact, Participants may very well understand themselves as integrated selves who cannot be represented so selectively or even reductively. For example, if I am represented only as a teacher, the possibility that my identity as a woman may get erased or elided. But essentialist claims of identity politics would insist on a single axis identity. These generalizations are made about particular social groups. But this may come to have a disciplinary function within the group. That is, if you do not conform to the identity imposed upon you by the group or dictated by the group, then you may find yourself outside the group 
as an other. So, the single axis of essentialist claims of identity dictate the self-understanding that its members should have. Therefore, the supposedly liberatory new identity may actually inhibit autonomy of the self, replacing one kind of tyranny with another. So, the other may be objectified through attribution, or the experience of the other may be assumed to be transparent or univocal. Both of these positions have to be understood in order to understand what is meant by the other. Objectification occurs when the other is made into an object, an it denied the status of a thou, an it rather than a person, a thing rather than a human being. This objectification deprives the other of agency, reducing it to one of its general characteristics. Thus, theoretical discourses defining otherness as race or class or gender or nationality see otherness as an attribute rather than as alterity or difference. On the other hand, if we define the other as half of a self or a dichotomy between the self and the other, distinguishing one person from another, then this aspect of identity politics can be seen as crystallized around the assumed transparency of experience to the oppressed and the univocality of its interpretation. However, critics have pointed out that experience is never simply epistemically available prior to interpretation. That is, my experience cannot be the basis of the experience of the other. I cannot categorize the experience of the other as different from my experience simply because I think of the other as a half of myself. So, experience requires a theoretical framework, implicit or explicit, to give it meaning. The theoretical experience I impose upon the other experience of the other is necessarily made by myself. So, I go back to attributing certain characteristics to the other. And this is the way in which otherness has been conceptualized in the context of race and indigeneity in post-colonial theory. For example, as we have discussed in the module on Commonwealth Literature, Homi Bhabha proposes hybridity as a way of understanding the post-colonial subject. This idea decenters the view of the unified other opposed to the unified self and posits the colonial subject as liminal at the margins, not unified or whole. But as we have seen before, Abdul Jan Muhammad has criticized this idea of Baba. Jan Muhammad brings together the phenomenologically neutral perception of irreducible difference, also called radical alterity, with the colonial construction of a hierarchy of humans based upon racial characteristics. So the difference which is placed in a hierarchy leads to a Manichaean allegory. These two elements together constitute a trope or a trick of language which by extension transforms racial difference into moral and even metaphysical difference. A simple example of this is the distinction between black and white, which is actually a racial distinction. However, we think not twice before attributing evil to blackness and purity to whiteness, thereby placing them in a hierarchy and putting this metaphor in the place of a moral and even metaphysical difference. A similar thing occurs with respect to gender. Gendered selves parallel discourses of racial identity in the tendency to humanize the other. So for feminist critics, the other would always be the other gender. Woman is the other, particularly in those discourses opposing patriarchy. 
when political rights are at issue, discourses refer both to woman as an other human being and to the female subject as a political entity, a theoretical move that unifies the subject as a person subjected to the law of the land. Simone de Beauvoir proposes the ethics of ambiguity to connect gender and humanism. She says that humanity is male and man defines woman not in herself but as relative to him. So the other is half or the other of the self. He is the subject, he is the absolute and she is the other. Judith Butler criticizes this exclusionary logic of the Beauvoir and she says that it signifies in the self-other binary an identity which points towards the limited usefulness of oppositional constructions, which manifest when just such signifying binaries as white, black, west, east, heterosexual, homosexual and man, woman merge with a fixed imaginary ego identity. Butler's analysis shows that otherness can be relative, making the interpersonal dichotomy of self and other endlessly reversible. How do we represent the other? In order to represent the other, we must understand what is truth. And truth, Nietzsche has said, is a mobile army of metaphors, metonyms and anthropomorphisms. In short, a sum of human relations which have been enhanced, transposed and embellished poetically and rhetorically and which, after long use, seem firm, canonical and obligatory to a people. So the truth is verbally constructed and a sum of human relations which are situational but after long use seem natural, firm, canonical and obligatory. According to Nietzsche, truths are illusions about which one has forgotten that this is what they are. In other words, representations purport to be truths whereas they are already and always a mobile army of metaphors, metonyms and anthropomorphisms constituted by the self. Into this paradigm, let us introduce the relational construction of self and other rather than the binary opposition of the self and the other. Othering is based on an identification of difference from the self. Both the self and the other are represented in the constructivist humanizing theories by a list of different and opposite attributes. This difference is claimed as essential and the foundational difference makes a truth claim about the world. Based on this claim taken as inherent or taken for granted, difference prescribes positions, inscribes hierarchy and proscribes recombination. This assumes that difference, once prescribed, is fixed forever. In and of themselves, such fixed and foundational differences are singular and located. But if we di view difference as an abstract idea, its insistent fixity renders it insufficient for the analysis of dynamic problems, whether the problems are intrapsychic, social or political. So how do we escape from essentialism? Essentialism claims that the other can be fully and unambiguously known and represented as essentially different from the self. The other is defined by the logic of difference which is irreducible. However, Grosberg ca cautions us that this logic of difference in which the other is defined by negativity can only rise to a politics of resentment. On the other hand, we have the proposal of radical alterity from Lacan. Radical alterity is difficult to take any political position or propose an op oppositional stand since both self and other are relational and constantly figured in respect of each other and the context of their interactions 
is never fixed. This demands an ethics of relationality. This call for the ethics is answered both by Butler and by Levinas in different ways. But they are both in general sympathy with the radical alterity or the relational idea of the other proposed by Lacan and critical of the discourses of phenomenology and existentialism, though their critiques through their critiques of Heidegger and Simone de Beauvoir respectively. According to Levinas, previous philosophy had reduced the other person to an object of consciousness by not preserving its absolute alterity, the innate condition of otherness by which the other radically transcends the self and the totality of the human network into which it is placed. As a challenge to self-assurance, the existence of the other is a matter of ethics because the ethical priority of the other equals the primacy of ethics, that is relations, over ontology, that is being, in real life. Simone de Beauvoir also focuses on the relational idea of self and other. The me-others relationship, she says, is as indissoluble as the subject-object relationship. Man can find a justification of his own existence only in the existence of other men. Now, he needs such a justification. There is no escaping it. Simone de Beauvoir explains that existentialist ethics condemns man's imposition of his choice and values upon another, whether in spirit of passion or pride. If it is true, she says, that every project emanates from subjectivity, it is also true that this subjective movement establishes by itself a surpassing of subjectivity towards the other. According to existentialism, no existence can be validly fulfilled if it is limited to itself. Existence appeals to the existence of others. To will oneself free and to will that there be being are one and the same choice, according to Simone de Beauvoir. This choice is that man makes of himself as a presence in the world. We can neither say that the free man wants freedom in order to desire being, nor that he wants the disclosure of being by freedom. These two are aspects of a single reality. If I want freedom for myself by virtue of being a human being, I would want freedom for the other human being also. And whichever be the one under consideration, whether the self or the other, they both imply the bond of each man with all others. Levinas feels that this is an abstract pre-given other who elicits a compulsory response of hospitality. However, if we go back to Heidegger, we will remember that Heidegger spoke of the constitution of the other in an existential space in which the project of my will meets the project of the will of the other. So, how does one approach the other? We cannot know otherness in its raw, pristine form, but not because its alterity is anchored in some unchanging fixity whose elusive essence is forever elusive, nor on account of the inaccuracy of representation owing to the arbitrariness of the sign and the endlessly deferred signified of a self-enclosed signifying system. We cannot know the other in its raw and pristine form because the other is separate and different and we cannot reduce the other to ourself. From here arises the ethical question how to approach the other. Literature is our approach to the other. According to Marcel Proust, by art alone, we are able to get outside ourselves, to know what another sees of this universe, which for him is not ours, the landscapes of which would remain as unknown to us as those of the moon. 
The discursive turn in literary criticism, however, takes a different view from Proust. It assumes that a transparency is there between the real and its mediation through language, being restricted to, yet dependent on, contextually specific systems of understanding and reductive closures that are necessary to render possible any kind of meaning production, to render the literary other coherent, even though this coherence is an imposed construct. This is completely different from what Proust says, because Proust's words clearly indicate that it is the indeterminate, not the determinate, the unknown, not the transparent, and the impossible not rather than the reductive that forms the literary event. Emmanuel Levinas would also criticize the position taken by Proust from the point of view that the notion of otherness as radically other is unthinkable, unrepresentable, and resists conceptualization. According to Levinas, the moment of otherness is articulated in positivist terms if it is drawn into the orbit of the self-same, whereby its alterity is eclipsed. And we have seen that according to Levinas, radical alterity characterizes the other and brings forward the possibility of an ethics. So, the limitations of an epistemological position bound by socio-culturally specific circumstances, the problem of other minds consequent upon the impossibility of experiencing another's experience, the impossibility of accessing the epistemic limit of other minds, motives and sensations of others, as well as that those of our own, pose questions to Proust's certainty of representation through literature. Is literature then impossible or is it altogether an other? Ethically, relating to the other and the literary attempt to narrate, recognize and understand the other are mutually exclusive courses of action, since in the process of describing and grasping otherness, one is also producing otherness, reshaping it to reflect one's own image. So literature has been seen as a formative force on account of its ability to produce imagined empathy, that is, to imagine that someone else is like me and their inner experiences are like my own. Levinas would constitute this as an unethical act to the extent that such an empathic understanding presumes that the other is knowable, is like me and can be subsumed within my own horizon of understanding. If grasped, the other would not be other. It would be an extension of myself. And in sympathy, through which we put ourselves in the other's place, Levinas warns, difference is annulled, whereby the other is merely known as another myself, as my alter ego. Recognizing the fact of finite human understanding, however, does not entail that we are blocked from any knowledge whatsoever or from partial and provisional understandings of the other. Epistemic access is limited but it is not impossible and neither is it prohibited. If it were, there would be no understanding, not in literature and neither in life. So, precisely on account of the limited access to other minds, imagination becomes a precondition for empathy and imagination is the source of literature. This is what renders literature pertinent to studies on otherness a quintessentially imaginative activity, literature and its unlimited range of characters accommodate a means to envision not only fictional others, but also what another sees of this universe, which for him is not ours, to momentarily plunge into other contexts removed spatially, temporally and culturally from ours. 
in this new literatures in English, this is the way that we have seen and tried to conceptualize otherness throughout the modules and throughout our readings. Our access to literature is affective and emotional rather than epistemic. Literature cannot give us scientific knowledge. It provides us understanding of the other. The artist and the writer force themselves to surmount existence in another way. They attempt to realize it as an absolute. What makes their effort genuine is that they do not propose to attain being. It is existence which they are trying to pin down and make eternal. The word, the stroke, the very marble indicate the object in so far as it is an absence. It is an imagination and realized through the medium of art. Only in the work of art, the lack of being turns to the positive. What is not there becomes something which is a product of art. Time is stopped. Clear forms and finished meanings rise up. In this return, existence is confirmed and establishes its own justification. This is why Immanuel Kant says, art is a finality without end. In conclusion, let us look at C.S. Lewis's An Experiment in Criticism. Lewis talks about literary criticism and the reading of literature and the position of the other in this crucial activity. My own eyes are not enough for me. I will see through those of others, he says. In this respect, literature is essential inasmuch as literary experience heals the wound without undermining the privilege of individuality. Because, as he explains, in reading great literature, I become a thousand men and yet remain myself. I see with myriad eyes, but it is still I who see. The philosophers we have considered in this module have written on otherness, literature and the self. You will find the, the names of these works in the section on learn more. Reading these philosophers, rather reading the works of these philosophers will enable you to understand more clearly the idea of otherness with which we approach all the new literatures that we will be reading in this course. Thank you.